ilaha illallah wa liyus salihin wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu ba'athu Allahu rahmatan lil alamin Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik wa an'im ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd So inshallah tonight the 29th of November 2022 uh, which I think is the 5th of Jumu'ah al-Ula 1444 uh, will uh, have the fourth session of the reading of Ikhtisam uh, al-Malal al-A'la or the uh, heavenly dispute, the discussion uh, that happened amongst the most exalted angels. And before we actually go into uh, tonight's lesson, uh, the author uh, broke this book down into three different parts. What are those three parts? Kafarat. What are kafarat? Uh, expiation of sins. So those deeds which a person can do to expiate sins. And, and he's mentioned broad rulings for this, but there are specific things that have come <coughs> in this hadith that are powerful in terms of the uh, expiation of, of sins. And the second section deals with what? Darajat. And what, are dara, what, what does that mean? The levels, right? So how does one become elevated in, in their level? Uh, or or how, does their, how do they raise in the ranks? Okay, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third section is what? Da'wat. Okay, so kafarat and darajat and da'wat. Da'wat being the plural of da'wah, and da'wah here being with the meaning of du'a. So the supplications that the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam uh, made at, towards the end of, of the hadith. And um, I think this is a. Uh, it's really this book is important because it's an anchor. Right? When a person finds themselves drifting, uh, wh wherever that drift may take him, th there needs to be something that gets us back on point to focus on what's really important. Um, as a brother said to me earlier today, and as simple <laughs> as it is, it's profound. You know, people talk about their bucket lists and stuff they want to do, and so on and so forth. <laughs> He said, he said, as cliche as this may sound, I'm just trying to go to Jannah because ain't really nothing else happening. And when you think about it, that, that's really the sum total of what we're trying to do as Muslims because this life, I mean, there are some pleasures of this life, no doubt, right? Uh, but at the expense of what? And so, so having that anchor to take me back to say, wait a minute, this whole deen, and it revolves around that concept of taqwa. And we are going to fall short in our implementation and, and manifestation of taqwa. We're going to fall short. So follow up that bad deed with a good deed and it will erase it. And now we're looking at these kafarat. Let's make sure that we're paying attention to the things that we're doing that may not be so good. So that we can make sure that we put something for us to erase that. Right? So th this is that anchor. And then there are darajat. Right? So alhamdulillah, if we've erased those sins, as Ibn Rajab mentioned uh, when we, what we took last week, was that sometimes we'll do is actually enough, right, to erase a person's sins. And so now the steps that you're taking to the masjid are actually <laughs> raising you. And, and, and level. And if, they, if, if the wudu is not powerful enough, right, to erase that person's sins or, or to expiate for the sins, then each, every other step, one is erasing the, the, the sins and the other one is raising him in, in, in rank, right? So the, the point is, though, to constantly be engaged in those things that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, inshallah, uh, we. In the first section, which is kafarat, the author talks about three distinct kafarat, three distinct uh, atoning deeds, if you will. The first one is what? The wudu. The second one is walking to the masjid. So today we're going to cover the third one. Bismillahi ta'ala. 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. May Allah, may Allah bless our teacher with good Ameen. and allow his efforts to, be, to weigh heavy on his scale of good. Ameen. Ameen. Uh, Ibn Rajab rahimahullah says in the heavenly dispute, the third, the uh, third reason. Note, note for those who may not have been here last week, you, you can always find where we are in the left hand corner. So if you look at the left hand corner, you see him on page 59, on page 59, because the reality is that even today, we're going to read almost everything, but there will be some things that we skip. So just if you lose your place, just look at the top left-hand corner, inshallah, and you'll know where we are. Maybe not. Nah. The fourth session, chapter four. The third reason to expiate sins is sitting in the masjid after the prayer. What is meant by sitting is waiting in, in, mes in the masjid for the next prayer, as in the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, waiting for a prayer after a prayer, and that is al-ribat, 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 that is al-ribat, al-ribat, that is al-ribat. Yeah, three, three times. So uh, Abu Huraira narrated that the Prophet ﷺ, so in the, in the wording of the hadith, in the wording of the hadith that we have, where the angels are discussing, what is it that? Uh, atones for one's deeds. Or what is it that expiates those those bad deeds that a person does? They they talked about al julus fil masajid, right? Sitting in the masjids. So Ibn Rajib rahmatullah is going to explain to us what does it mean sitting in the masjid? Is just sitting in the masjid by itself? What are you supposed to be doing? What does that mean sitting in the masjid? So he says what. What that means is that you're in the masjid waiting huh, for the next prayer. So that's what's meant when we say sitting in the masjid. It means that you are waiting for the next prayer. So it comes in a hadith of Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala, and who said that the Prophet, alayhi salatu was salam, said, intidharu salati ba'da salat, waiting for one prayer after you have already prayed. فَذَلِكُمُ ribat. So I, they, they translate as the firm hold. Uh, which is interesting because it's almost like it's two different translators. And when, we tra when we turn the page, inshallah, you'll see, or maybe even on the same page, it, they'll express that ribat is something else. So we've talked about the meaning of ribat. Does anybody remember what we said about ar ribat? Ar ribat. Mm. Tied down to something. Okay, rupt. Yeah, if you, if you, when you tie something to something else, that's a. That is a rub. Good. Okay. Keep going. What else did we say? Rabbit is the same. It's tying, connecting something to something else. Huh. What we mentioned, what is the Prophet like some actually referring to when he says al ribat? Because that's a, actually a, it's a specific form of protection. Holding the deen together, right? Lala, what's Guarding tayyib. Outside of the. Who said it? Hey, well, people who the people who are stationed on the borders, the frontiers, they're called the murabitun. Why are they called murabitun? Because they are practicing ribat, okay, or murabata. So, so they are there at the borders, making sure that the enemies are not coming into to the to the Muslim territories. They they're not going anywhere. They're not. They stay in one place, and that's at the border. To, hold, to protect it. So as the brother mentioned, it, it, when, when you're staying in the masjid, waiting from one salat to the next salat in the obedience of Allah, you're protecting your iman. You're protecting your deen. Right? For that, ikum ar-ribat. So the firm hold doesn't really bring it, you know, doesn't bring that, that meaning. Right? That ikum ar-ribat. That is the actual connection that is the protection that is the uh, uh, I, I, actually, I would have probably left it as ribat because he's going to explain what that means anyway. Uh, so, inshallah, we, we'll move on. Now. The length of time spent in obedience impacts the reward. Okay, so those are just notes on the side, as we mentioned before. Uh, when, you're, when you're reading a book, it is important to use your margins, right, so that when you go back, you can look for your main takeaways. Okay, so the main takeaway here, 
is, is that, that the length of time spent in obedience will impact the reward. So he made the, so he made this the same as guarding the frontier, Rabab. Right, guarding the frontier. He made what the same as guarding the frontier? Frontier. Staying in the masjid after one salat, waiting for it for the next salat. Uh -huh. In the way of Allah, fi sabilillah, the, the mighty and majestic. This is better, afdal, than merely sitting before the prayer to begin. For the, one who is, who, for the one who sits in the masjid waiting to perform the prayer, then leave after completing the prayer, shorten, shortens his stay. So, so what, it, what it says in Arabic, taqsul muddat, yani baqa'ihi. So uh, his stay is not that long. I mean, it's the bottom line. And if a person comes in the masjid uh, 10 minutes before the salah, 15 minutes before the salah, they're waiting for the salah, that's good. That's a good thing. And in fact, it's one of the major... Uh, ways to increase the possibility of I mean, the, the, the potential to have khushur in your salat. Right? Because there's a difference between somebody who actually came to salat early, they're waiting for the salat, and a person who knows that they're rushing to get to the salat. I mean, it's just automatically there's going to be a difference in, in disposition. So he's saying that that's good, and that is a good thing to, to come prior to the salat and sit and wait for the salat. But that's normally going to be a, a much smaller time, right? than a person who's sitting from one salat waiting for the next salat to come in. Because right? that's going to be a couple hours, well, unless it's between Maghrib and Isha. But other than that, it's going to be a couple hours. Yeah. As opposed to the one who prays and then sits waiting for the, for the next prayer, then this waiting is longer. Yeah, his waiting is longer because you're waiting from one prayer to the next. That's going to be longer. And therefore, the person is going to get more reward, as he mentions here. Every time one prays a prayer, then sits and waits for the next prayer, spends his whole time in obedience, and that is... Okay. Spends his whole time in obedience. It, it, here it says that is equal to guarding the frontier in the way of Allah. He says that he could be menzilat, uh, meaning, meaning it, it holds a similar status. doesn't mean it's equal. Um, and, and that's because a person who's at literally putting their lives on the line to defend the Muslims, Hey, we're not going to say somebody sitting in the, in the masjid has the exact same reward or is equal in reward. But the Prophet Sallallahu is mentioning that their status is similar and that there's an obvious comparison between two. Now, tell you. What? Oh, it went out? Phone. Play. Uh, if you can just follow, inshallah, we'll, we'll, we're going to do it. We're on pages at the end of page 59 and leading into page 60 uh, from the Musnad. So every time one prays a prayer, then sits and waits for the next prayer, spends his whole time in obedience, and that is equal to. to uh, or that is uh, like or similar to guarding the frontier in the way of Allah, the mighty and the majestic. Yeah. And well, well, why is that? Because what's, what's happening? When a person... Hey, alhamdulillah. Play. Okay. So when, when, a, when a person uh, prays and then is waiting for the next prayer, the, and, and the author is going to talk about this in a minute, inshallah, but the idea is that you're spending that time in obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that part is important. It's not just that you sit in the message and do whatever you want to do, or you talk about whatever you want to talk about, or you call somebody on the telephone. Uh, no, the, the idea is that you're sitting in the masjid using that time in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is what counts as a ribat. All right? Play it. Now. Virtues of waiting in the masjid. In the Musnad and Sunan ibn Majah, on the authority of Abdullah ibn Amr radiallahu anhu who said, who said, we finished praying with the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Maghrib prayer. 
Those who wanted, to, who, who wanted to leave departed, and those who wanted to stay behind remained behind. Then, then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came in suddenly grasping for breath. It should, it should say gasping for breath. Gas, gasping for breath, and his knees were visible. Uh, what does that mean? His <laughs> knees were visible. Hmm? Right, right. He was running so fast. Okay, running so fast that his Izar. <laughs> That his Izar came up, you can see his knees. Oh. Another time that the campaigns mentioned that they saw the knees of the Prophet والسلام, when he was running. Anybody know when that was? <laughs> uh, when he was running between Safa and Marwa. Yeah. Yeah. Nah. He said, Have glad tidings. Your Lord has opened a door from the doors of the heavens, boasting about you to the angels, saying, Look at my servants. They have performed an obligatory prayer, and they are waiting for the next one. SubhanAllah. So, there are a few things to pay attention to in this hadith. They, they just, they finished the Maghrib Salah, right? So at the end where it says they... It, where, look at my servants. Okay, they have performed an obligatory prayer. Yani maghrib. They are waiting for the next one. Yani salat al isha. All right, now that 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 actually happens to be the the shortest time uh, that we have between obligatory prayers. And if a person can subhanallah, yani even if it's just one day a week, for example, if a person can just set aside and say, that's going to be. The day that I, I sit into the I can't maybe I can't do it every night I can't do it, but inshallah once a week I can sit in the message between Maghrib and Isha and he make it your project it's a project you work on from now to the rest of your life and he, because at the end of the day it, it is all about Jannah there's really nothing else going on for real so these type of things that you can take and they're not overburdensome right it once a week and then inshallah. It, when Allah puts in your heart the desire and the love for that, it'll turn to two days and even more. Um, and that was, the, that was the way of many of the, the salaf. Yani when things would, were difficult for them or they didn't necessarily find it particularly enjoyable in the beginning. But they would push themselves and push themselves until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it something that they loved, that they couldn't do without. Right? So, here we have the Prophet alayhi salatu Coming out quickly, right? Gasping for breath, as if he was losing his breath so fast that you could see his knees. And he said, Abshiru. He wanted to give them the glad tidings. And this shows you, subhanAllah, the compassion that the Prophet ﷺ had for this ummah. That when he got that good news, that he wanted to make sure that he got it to them as quickly as possible and that he conveyed the message. And that was his job, alayhi salatu was salam, was to convey the message of Islam, to convey revelation. So he revealed this to, yeah, he came out with this uh, revelation to his companions, radhi Allah ta'ala anhum, and was so happy to inform them that Allah azza wa jal was praising them to the angels. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not against translating yubahi, be him as boasting, right? But uh, even from the, the, the perspective, I, how the ulama talk about al-baha yani, in, in Arabic and then yubahi, it's yani, yu'adhimuhum, yani, fi hadrat al-mala'ika. So he's glorifying them in the presence of, in the presence of the angels. He's praising them yani, to the angels. What, why do you think that's a thing? Uh, just think about that for a second. Have you ever heard of any other hadith? Uh, hadith? Where Allah Azza wa Jal mentions people to the angels and praises them to the angels? Yeah? When he loves a person, he tells the angels. When he, when he loves a person, he tells the angels. But that's a little different than him actually praising people to the angels. <coughs> Groups of people, mentioning them. Hmm. Any other times? Yeah. When a person uh, uh, praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah praises them in the in a better Okay, so, so Allah Azza wa Jal mentions Yani when a person praises Allah in a gathering, then Allah praises them in a gathering that is uh, better than that, than that gathering. Tell you one else. The ones who sit, talk about the book of the, the ones who sit in the masjid, uh, reciting the book of Allah, uh, and studying 
meanings of the Book of Allah amongst themselves, then uh, Allah Azza wa mentions them to the angels. Any other time? Several other times. But a person maybe, subhanAllah, it wouldn't be a bad idea for somebody to compile that, uh, that information. Uh, maybe somebody even sitting in the message right now could, could work on that. No, I'm not going to point out anybody directly. I'm not even going to look in the direction. <laughs> but uh, it, it would be great because there, there is a common denominator. So you, you think about the, the allies, which y'all mentions the, uh, the people of Arafa, right? I see it's Arafa. When they, when they get to Arafa and he, and he says to the angels, and look, at, look at my servants. And he, what, what do they want? They you're going for out of it to, to for trade and for business and or to hurt people or no. Going there strictly for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to call upon him and, and ask for his forgiveness and ask for what they want of the good of this life and the next. But the, the the interesting thing is, what did the angel say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he told them that he was going to create Adam and put a khalifa on the earth? Huh? What did the angel say? You're going to put somebody on, on earth who's going to cause corruption and they're going to shed blood. Huh? We, we, the angels, we, we're praising you constantly, singing your praises, mentioning you. Allah said to them, I know what you all don't know. And so it's as if Allah Azza wa Jal is reminding them, look at, look at them. Look at these ones mm. I created as the khulafa mm. of the earth. They're remembering me. They're praising me. Mm. They're worshiping me. In the alam I know what you don't know. Right? <laughs> the, the common denominator for all of those, if you, and if you gather it up, you, you'll see for yourself, yourself inshallah, the common denominator is their remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It, whether that is them seeking knowledge, because seeking knowledge is a, is a form of dhikr, and it is going to keep them in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Them going to Arafah is a major form of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what's on their tongue the entire time, right? So that remembrance of Allah azza wa jalla is what puts a person in position to be mentioned by Allah azza wa jalla to, to the angels, the most exalted angels at that. Now, in the Musnad, it is reported on the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, who narrated from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, saying, "The person waiting for the next prayer after a prayer is like the knight whose horse is strong in the face of his enemy. The angels of Allah send salutations upon him as long as he remains in a, pure, a state of purity and does not leave. That is the greatest form of guarding the frontier." Amen. So that is the greatest form of ribat. Okay, that is the greatest form of ribat. Here in this in this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentions that the angels are praying. So so in the first hadith, one of the benefits that we gain is that the person who is sitting in the masjid, yani waiting for the next salat, that Allah wa is praising them to the angels. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, his praise and his mention of them to the angels is then in turn met by the angels with prayer for mm -hmm. the believers. Right? He mentions them to, he mentions those people waiting for salat to the angels, and then the angels in turn are praying for those people. Clear? Mm -hmm. Like, yani, subhanAllah, not, obviously this is, uh, this is on a different level. But sometimes you may forget about uh, a person, right? Uh, somebody comes to you and say, you know, so-and-so, yeah, mashallah, uh, I just saw him, he's doing some really good things. And then you say, man, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put butter in his efforts, may Allah. You start what? You start making dua for them mm -hmm. because somebody mentioned to you some of the, the good that they were doing. Or somebody mentioned, for example, they're not feeling so well. So you start making dua for them. And again... Here, Allah Azza wa Jalla is mentioning these people to the angels, and then the angels begin to to what? To pray for those for those people. Subhanallah. Nah. Okay. 
What should one do while waiting? In the statement, sitting in the masjids after the prayers. This, is all, this also covers sitting for the remembrance of Allah, reading the Quran, listening to knowledge and teaching it and so on. And he says and so on. So, so what do we get from that? So the, he mentions four things here. He says what? So you're sitting in the masjid after the prayers. He says this is covering what? Dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what are you doing while you're waiting for the next prayer? Mm -hmm. Remembering Allah. Or what? Dhikr. Reading the Quran. Or you're listening to a somebody. somebody teach. Or you're teaching yourself and so on and so forth. The point is to be engaged in what? The remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If, if you wanted to have that reward uh, and be strong in its ability to, to expiate your sins. Now. Especially after the morning prayer, until the sunrise. Okay, so if we look down at the bottom. Uh, so there, there, there is a uh, hadith uh, that most of the scholars of hadith that are, that have some level of I mean, strong knowledge of hadith, they say the hadith is is not strong, and that's the hadith where the one who sits. In the masjid after Salat al Subh, after Salat al Fajr, and they sit in the masjid until sunrise, and then they pray two rakats. He will have the reward of Hajj and Umrah complete, 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 meaning as if he has made Hajj and Umrah. And many of the scholars. Of hadith, as I mentioned, they say his hadith is not strong. That actually, whether it is or not, whether that reward, specific reward, is associated with it or not, is no doubt. The Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ was to sit in the masjid after Fajr till sunrise. That was his Sunnah. Now, whether that particular specific reward is attached to that practice or not, that's a different story. But the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and we are all trying to be people who emulate his sunnah, his sunnah was to sit in the masjid. Jabir ibn Samara, and that's the hadith at the bottom. Jabir, and this is Sahih Muslim, he said that Jabir ibn Samara radiallahu ta'ala, who said, the Nabi وسلم, كان إذا صلى الفجر جلس في مصلى حتى تطلع الشمس حسنا. Right? That the Prophet وسلم, after he would pray Salat al Fajr, he would sit in his musalla. So that could mean the exact place that he prayed, right? that he sat there, or it could mean in the general area of, of the masjid. And if the Prophet وسلم, would sit there until the sun rose, I don't know, this is a really bad translation, but nicely, and it was clear that the sun had, had risen. Not just that it peaked out over the, the horizon. Uh, obviously, that's not a time for prayer anyway. And you want to wait until the sun is actually uh, is risen above the horizon. Mm -hmm. So this is the hadith. Uh, and there are other hadith which, are, which I mean, clearly indicate that this was the practice of the Prophet ﷺ, that he would sit in the masjid until sunrise. Now, the texts that have been reported show the virtue of that. It is similar to the one that sits and waits for the next prayer because he has performed what he came to the masjid to do and now sits and waits for another form of obedience. Ah, uh, okay. What, what, what is the author trying to get across here? So if you look at the previous hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam rushed out, right, to, to let them know this virtue of sitting in the masjid and, and waiting for the next salat, he, he said what? The qadha faridha that they, that they prayed an obligatory prayer and they're waiting for the, for the next one. Okay, if you sit in the masjid after Fajr and you wait until the sunrise, right, and then you pray, are you sitting waiting for another obligatory salat? Yeah. Uh, do you understand what the... So the author is saying, even though you're not waiting for another obligatory salat, you're still waiting to perform another act of, of ibadah. And so the reward is similar. Okay, that's what he's trying to get across. Is that clear? Yeah. Alhamdulillah. All right. Uh, okay. All right. Now, 
One is in the state of prayer so long as the prayer is what keeps him in the masjid. It has been reported in Bukhari that the Prophet ﷺ said, There is no group of people that gather in a house from the houses of Allah. Yeah, and he from, uh, who gathers in the masjid. No. The Most High, reciting the book of Allah, studying it between themselves, except tranquility dis descends upon them. So that's, not, that's number one. Okay, so look, look at the virtue of sitting in the masjid, right? Reciting and studying the book of Allah. And by the way, as we covered in uh, Al Wasiyah Surah, yani, that also includes this type of study what we're doing right now. And I think I mentioned before a story of one of Sheikh Uthameen's students, Rahimahullah. Uh, his name is Sheikh Omar al Harkan. And uh, he was teaching a class in, in Medina. Uh, it, it was a Dora, yani one of those um, like intense uh, seminars, intensives or whatever. And it was on Fara'it, which is which is the study of inheritance, right? So I was really excited. Um, I, w I wanted to, st I had studied before, but I wanted to study it again. And so I went to the message and um, he starts off his, uh, his talk with Khairukum man ta'allam al Quran wa allama. Best of you are those who learn the Quran and teach. And I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, where are you going with this one? I came here to study. Fara'id, right? So I think he's going to start teaching tafsir or something. And, um, and then he mentioned um, this about studying the book of Allah in the masjid. And I was like, man, you know, I thought I turned up at the wrong dars. And then he said, then he started reading the ayat from Surah to nisa Right? So basically, second page of Surah to nisa on, and for a few ayat, uh, all it's dealing with is detail. You know, inheritance laws. And he said, so Allah Azza wa Jal detailed, right, the, the laws of inheritance. And this is what we're going to be covering and in this particular class. So it's an extension of the study of the Book of Allah. Mm. And I never, I, I didn't piece that together until, until that moment. Mm. And he subhanAllah. So sometimes uh, when we think about this hadith and we think reciting the Book of Allah and studying amongst themselves, that this is restricted to you know, like you're picking up a book of tafsir or, or, or you know, everybody's reading the ayat together. Not, this, this is a broader study of understanding the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No. Except tranquility, des tranquility des descends upon them. That's and mercifully. Yeah, that's number one. Tranquility descends. Uh -huh. And mercy envelops them. Uh, envelops them. So it number two, them. the mercy. Uh, actually, ghashiyatum al rahma like the... Uh, al, 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 uh, Ghashiyatum means like it comes, it not just envelops like surrounds, but it actually penetrates the gathering, like the mercy is in the gathering. No. The angels surround them. That's number three. Uh -huh. And Allah mentions them to those who are present with him. And that is number four, that Allah mentions them to those who are present with him. And subhanAllah, and from, and Allah knows best, but from the virtues that one gets from Allah mentioning him or her in the presence of the angels, <laughs> is that those angels that make dua for that, for that person. Nah, subhanAllah, nah. As for the one sitting before the prayer, waiting for a specific prayer, then he is considered in the prayer, and he is considered in the prayer until he actually prays. Yani, in other words, he is receiving the reward yani, for being in prayer. Because the only thing that's keeping him in that place is what? It's prayer. It's salah. In the two sahihs, it is reported on the authority of Anas radiallahu anhu from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that when he once de delayed the Isha prayer very late, so when he came out to pray with them, he said to them, Indeed, you are in the state of prayer as long as you are waiting for the prayer. Mm -hmm. Also reported by them on who's, the... Who's them? Who's uh, them? The, 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 the sahihain. The sahihain. Bukhari and Muslim. Right. Always do your best to understand pronouns. Right? So as you're reading, make sure you understand the pronouns. Now. On the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said, The angels send prayers on any one of you as long as he is in the place of prayer and remains in a state of pur purity by saying, O oh Allah, forgive him. Oh, Allah, have mercy upon him. Notice this is the second time there's been a narration about 
uh, the angel send a prayer or anyone of you as long as now as long as he remains in a state of tahara, mm. as long as he remains in a state of tahara. So that is that is a condition for receiving these specific rewards. Now you continue to be in a state of prayer as long as it is the prayer that keeps you waiting. Uh, that keeps you waiting. Nothing other than the prayer keeps him from going back to his family. Mm -hmm. In a narration of Muslim, as long as he does not harm anyone and does not break his state of purification. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna actually cover that again now. So in that in that narration of Sahih Muslim, he he adds. So we in the first narration it says as long as he stays in Tahara, right? In another narration it says as long as he does not harm anyone ma lam yu'di ahadan huh mm. and he does not break his state of purification L look at this istinbat or, or th this um this benefit that uh, ibn rajab has derived from this wording because it's powerful yeah go ahead this shows that the meaning of not breaking the state of purification is what is said on the tongue and so forth by by way of harming others. In other words, in other words, staying pure mm -hmm. or in a state of purity uh, is not just ritual purity, okay? Uh, meaning meaning having will do, but it's also that you keep your tongue pure, right? Subhanallah, which is a, which is a major. I, I did not. See if anyone else from the ulama had the same opinion, but I, I think it's a, a major uh, benefit derived by, by Ibn Rajab. Rahimahullah. So he says again, this shows that the meaning of not breaking the state of purification or at tahara is it also includes uh, not saying, it also includes keeping your tongue pure, not harming people with your tongue. Now, also, it was explained by Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu as breaking of purification from the prior parts. Yeah, and he, what, he, what he means here is yeah, defecation or urination, breaking wind. No. And it has, it has been said to include both. Yeah, and that seems to be the stronger opinion there is that it includes both. No. In summary, sitting, sitting in the masjid for actions of obedience has great virtue. As, report, as reported in the hadith of the on the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu that the, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said no Muslim who regularly attend the masjid masjids to perform the prayers and remember Allah except that Allah is pleased with him just as the family of one who is absent feels happy when he comes back to them SubhanAllah <clears throat> So uh, here, uh, he's, the author is going to switch gears just a little bit, okay, to to start talking about the the masjid itself. So he said, "There is no Muslim who regularly attends the masjid to perform prayers and remembers Allah, except that Allah Azawajal is pleased with him. Why? Because he came to where? To the house of Allah Azawajal. Just as the family of one who was absent, right, mm -hmm. feels happy when when he comes comes back to them, or should, mm -hmm. or should. Some people are tyrants." And their families are so happy when they're not home. And when they come home, everybody's got to, you know, play a role. A man whose heart is attached to the masjid. It has been narrated by Daraj. Daraj. Daraj from Abdul Haytham. La Abul Haytham. Abul Haytham. On the authority of Abu Sa'id radiallahu anhu from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said, whoever loves the masjid, Allah loves him. In the masjid, Allah azza wa jal said, ahabbu al-biladi, the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam said, ahabbu al-biladi alallahi ilallahi masajiduha. Right, that the most beloved places on earth are the what? Are the masajid. Wa abghaduha aswaquha. And the most despised places to Allah on earth are, are the aswaq, yeah, the marketplaces. Uh, big marketplaces, what, what's happening in those places? It, most people are just, I mean, it's, it's a place of negligence at the end of the day. There are people that are not remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, 
where they engage. Some people are lying to sell their products. That's that's a lot of people. Um, uh, where there's a, a heavy focus on dunya, right? And nisyan al akhirah. I ain't to, I'm forgetting that the hereafter. Obviously, a person has to go to the marketplace at some point. I mean, you have to. It's, it's not that. And some people work there. In fact, and the Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam, and he mentions the the virtue of the honest businessman, right? So, I mean, some people have to be involved in that. But but this is about you know just frivolously spending time in the marketplaces. These marketplaces are the most despised places of Allah. And to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth, and the masajid are the most most beloved places. And uh, I, I've mentioned before, but I think it's worth mentioning again, especially because this is that, that consumer time of the year um, where people are looking for deals and shopping and sometimes online for hours, uh, waiting in line for hours or online for hours, right? What, what's, what's that ratio look like? What's the ratio? How much time you spend in the sukh? How much time you spend in the masjid? Masjid are the most beloved places to Allah, right? So if the time is equal, that's a problem. If the time is more than a person is spending in a sukh than they spend in a masjid, that's an even bigger problem, right? So I consider that, inshallah. Sa'id ibn Musayyib. Sa'id ibn al Musayyib said, whoever sits in the masjids, then uh, it is. Oh, hold on. Where, where, where's the Abu, Abu Musayyib? Who's Sayyid ibn Musayyib? Where's Abu Musayyib? I thought it was. Ah. Who's Sayyid ibn Musayyib? They call him the master of the Tabi'een. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Sayyid the Tabi'een, mashallah. Whoever sits in the masjid. Then... It's important. Sometimes we go by these names, we don't realize who these people were. Mm -hmm. I mean, he wasn't a companion of the Prophet, but after the companions, he was considered to be Sayyid the Tabi'een. And he was the leader of all of the tabi'in. Oh. Nah. Whoever sits in the masjid, then, then it is like he is in a gathering with Allah, the mighty and majestic. It has been authentically reported from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he counted of the he counted of the seven who will be shaded by Allah's Rani, shade. The, 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 that category, seven types of people who will be shaded in the shade of Allah subhanahu wa taala on the day. Nah. On the day there is no shade except his. Except for his, a, a man whose heart is connected to the masjid, then he leaves it, he is longing to return back. Yeah. Mu'allaq is to be, is to be, it's not just connected, it's, it's hung somewhere, right? Mm. Um, so it's almost like his heart is hung up in the masjid. So even when he goes out, where is his heart? His heart is at the masjid, mm. right? Even when he goes out there, that's not where his heart is. His heart is still back at the masjid. Right, and that's the explanation there. When he leaves it, he's longing to, to return back. But the point is here also, he does leave the masjid. And we have to understand that this deen is balanced. It's not just, especially you know, for somebody who has a family that, that, that needs them, you don't just, you don't just Sit in the masjid all day and expect that the risk of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to come out the sky. And you know that the sky is not raining down gold and silver. No, don't sit up there. That, that's tawakul. That's not tawakul. That's fake reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you're just sitting around and somebody's saying, well, brother, you, you need to work. And I'm you know, making dua and that's. Nah, I'm making dua to find the means of, of earning a living, right? So, so the point is the man leaves the masjid, but his heart remains in the masjid. He's just going out there because he has to do what he has to do. And he's not attached to those other things. Nah. Indeed, staying in the masjid for acts of obedience is a way of expiating sins. Uh, uh, one second. Yeah. Um, I'm, we're actually going to cover that here, okay? So, if you bear with me, inshallah. Uh, the translation here is a bit, um, doesn't bring home the, the point that the author is making. So, we just go through this quickly, inshallah. The author, rahmatullah, says, وَإِنَّمَا 
كان ملازمة المسجد مكفرا للذنوب لأن فيه مجاهدة النفس وكفا لها عن أهوائها. So that part we need to understand. He says that staying in the masjid at length or mulazamatul masjid, yani adhering to the masjid. He says that it only expiates sins due to what it requires of mujahadatun nafs, self-struggle and restraint. Yani in other words, a person is refraining kaffan laha and ahwa'iha is refraining from the desires that he has. So again, he says what? That adhering to the measure and staying there is an expiation of sins because of this, because of this, okay? Because of the fact that a person is struggling against himself and refraining from his desire. Read what it says there. Indeed, staying in the, in the masjid for acts of obedience is a way of ex expiating sins because it requires struggling against oneself, holding back one's desires. You, you see, that, that's not what he said. He said, what, what the author says is that it's, it is only an expiation of sins because it requires struggling against oneself and holding back one's desires. All right? All right. Then he goes and says, For in the halatumilu, إلا إلى الانتشار في الأرض بجغاء الكسب والمجالس للناس ومحادثتهم أو للتنزه في الدور الأنيقة والمساكن الحسنة وموات النزهة ونحو ذلك طيب go ahead. go ahead Holding back one's desires which, lean, which, which leans towards going out into the earth seeking sustenance or enjoying the company of people and conversing with them or going out for leisure in elegant places and living in nice homes and other places of recreation. So he, he also didn't mention, uh, nah, follow. So whoever restrains himself by staying in the masjid for acts of obedience, then he is guarding for the sake of Allah, going against his desires, and that is the best forms of patience and struggle. What the author, Rahmatullah, is trying to show us. He mentions different desires that people have. All of those require that a person leave the masjid. And you want to go talk with your friends, you want to go hang out here, you want to, you want to sit in this nice place and all of these other things. All of that requires what? That you leave the masjid. So when you're staying in the masjid, then you're going against that, that desire that you have to do these other things. Okay? And because of that self-restraint for the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your sins are being expiated, okay? Because you're exercising that sabr and that jihad. Now, okay. So, also, go ahead, read what it says here. This type of action, i.e., what, what pains the self and opposes his desires is an expiation of sins. Even though the servant does not have any illness that would expiate his sins and the like. What do you understand from that? What, do, what does that mean? This, this type of action, meaning what pains the self and opposes desires, is an expiation of sins even though you don't have even though you're not sick. Uh-huh. And you're you're holding back your, your, your desires and all all of those things. Uh -huh. That it I I'll give you a hint. There's a translation problem. Now. So keep going. And then we'll go and then I'll go back and translate, shall we? So how would it be for the one who goes out of his own way to choose an action in order to draw near to Allah? The mighty and majestic. All right, so let's look at what the Arabic says. He says, وَهَذَا الْجِنْسِ أَعْنِي مَا يُؤْلِمُ النَّفْسِ وَيُخَالِفُ هَوَاهَا So this, uh, this genre, if you will, this category, right? And he says, what I mean by this category are those things that are difficult upon the self 
يعني, upon the soul and, and goes against the desires. So it contradicts your desires. Okay? He says, this category of things, فيه كفارة للذنوب, expiates sins. وَإِن كَانَ لَا سُنْعَ فِيهِ لِلْعَبْدِ كَالْمَرَضِ وَنَحْوِي He says, even if a person doesn't have any hand in that thing, it expiates the sins if it's difficult for the self. If it's difficult for the soul, it expiates sins. Even if you don't have a hand in that thing, like if you were sick, because you didn't make yourself sick or otherwise. Those things that you don't even have a hand in, pay, pay attention, because this point, is, he's really trying to hammer home a point here. Okay? And the, and the point that he's hammering home is that if the things that you don't intentionally do but are difficult for you, you haven't done them to yourself. Like you got sick or you, or, you, or you pricked yourself. You stubbed your toe, whatever, right? Those things expiate sins or not? They expiate sins. Even though you didn't really have a hand in that. That wasn't something you intentionally did. He says, How much more so then? The striving that a person does, intentionally try, trying to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, intentionally trying to draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how much more so would that be an expiation of, of his sins? Because if, he's, if his sins are being expiated for difficulty he faces, that he's, that, right, that, that is involuntary, right, involuntary difficulty, then how much more so for the difficulty that he faces voluntarily trying to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, for in the min no il jihad fi sabilillah. This is a type of jihad. For the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, takfir al dunubi kulliha. That that as a result, a person's sins, all of them will be expiated. Now, if you go back and you read this. <laughs> That's very far. Like, this one is one of those ones. Mashallah, yani. The translation in general is, is acceptable. But there are certain places where you come and the total meaning is not there. Like the meaning is not there. I, I think this meaning is very important. I think because it shows the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any difficulty you face, you have the law, whatever that may be, sins are being expiated. Don't think for a minute. Even the Prophet said, Ma asab al abd. Even the, 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 the worry that you have about the future, though it should be moderate, a person has to be careful. Or the, or the sorrow that a person faces because of something that already happened. Those are with people that's infatuation that some people have today with mental illness and highlighting it. Mental illness is a real thing. I'm not saying it's not, but I'm saying sometimes there's reasons why people highlight certain things at certain times. There's industries behind this stuff. Okay, there's a lot of money to be made. In this country, they worship the dollar. Don't get it twisted. That's what they worship. And so if there's a dollar to be made off of something, they will make you think that that's the most important thing in the world because there's ways to make money off of that. They got the whole 60% of the population on drugs and things like that for anxiety and so forth. There's a lot of money to be made off of that stuff. Anyway, so the point is, the Prophet Adi Salatu Salaam talked about this from before and he said even that the anxiety that you have about things that may may happen or the the, the sorrows the sorrow that you feel for things that have happened in the past that mental anguish that you go through it expiates sins even a thorn that pricks you expiates sins these are mostly things that are what involuntary they're not things that you seek out they just happen so if Allah is with you out of his immense mercy for the children of Adam is allowing, is causing their sins to be expiated through those things, then how much more so for the, you striving to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and through that striving, what, you're facing some level of difficulty. Then even more so, that's going to be an expiation of sins. Clear? That's the meaning that, that the author is trying to get across here. Wallahu a'lam. Now, we're almost done, by the way. It's the last page. Ziyad, the free slave of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, was one of the righteous worshippers. One of the righteous worshippers, 
he used to frequent the masjid in Medina. Once he was heard rebuking himself saying, Where do you want to go? To somewhere better than this masjid? You want to see the house of such and such? Hey, subhanAllah. And sometimes you got to talk to yourself like that. You know? And you feel like you want to lead a message. You say, well, where, where, where are you trying to go? Where do you want to go? Somewhere better than here? Yeah. The masjids on earth are the houses of Allah. That Allah has attached to himself. In attached order. to himself, he says, he, 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 uh, the word he uses is adhafa hayla nafsi. In other words, he ascribed them to himself. He, he, he put his name next to them. Attached, I don't know, maybe. Nah. To himself in order to honor them. The hearts of those who love Allah, the mighty and majestic, are connected to them. Because they are connected to him. So they are at ease, frequently visiting them in order to declare his remembrance inside of them. That's uh Oh okay, yeah, cut off. Okay. Uh now. Yeah, this is uh wow, I didn't pick that up. Okay, yeah, that should have been up top, right? Uh so if we be using Adina Allah and Total Fire, we use Karufiya Smoo, Sabi Lahu Via Bulgudu Yula Asal. Is it like that in the book? In the print edition? Translation? Yeah, it is. Yeah, okay. So that uh, yeah, that's that's not correct. Rijalu la tulhihim tijaratu la bayun and zikri la yun as so. Nah. So, yeah, they didn't mention the 37th ayah. Okay, Fadla, read the English. In the houses which Allah has permitted to be built and in which His name is per, uh, remembered, there are men who proclaim His limitless, His limitless glory in the morning and the evenings. Not distracted by trade or commerce, commerce from the remembrance of Allah and from constancy in the in, in prayer and from giving regular charity, they fear a day when Allah, when all hearts and and eyes will be in turmoil. Okay, so main idea here is the importance of frequenting the masjid, which are the most beloved places. To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth. Yeah. Where would those that love go if the if not to the houses of their protector? Mm. The hearts of those who love are connected to the houses of the of the one they love, and the steps of the worshippers to the houses of the one they worship are frequent. Nah. Tell you, so the fifth session, inshallah. Which is the mention of the ranks at Darajat uh, will continue in January, inshallah ta'ala, of 2023. This will be the last lesson for 2022, bi ta'ala. Uh, there's a lot to go back over. I, I genuinely encourage, and, and you see the connection between what we're studying here and Al Wasiya Surah uh, as well. And, and this is about implementation. It's about ilm, but it's also about amal, right? So it's about knowledge and then putting that knowledge in, into practice. And I would hope, yeah, and, and subhanAllah, on a personal level, uh, just rereading many of those ahadith about, about wudu, it, it changes the way you make wudu. Uh, Reading those ahadith about the virtue of going to the masjid and walking to the masjid should change the way that we approach that. You want to frequent it more. Sitting in the masjid, I mean, learning these things. Again, much of this, some people, some people, their style is to jump in both feet first, alhamdulillah, and, and they're able to stay consistent. And other people, they have to do it gradually. You're going to know yourself better than somebody else. But all of these things, can and should be practiced on some level, on some level, including I mean, sitting in the masjid and waiting for prayer. So maybe, maybe you can't do it all the time, but maybe on a weekend, you can sit in the masjid from Fajr and then wait until sunrise. I and mean, everybody knows their own circumstances, 
And Allah Azza wa Jalla is kareem, subhanAllah. So that effort that you make to please him will not go, and he is shakur, subhanAllah ta'ala. It's appreciative. That is not going to go unthanked. And so put forth that effort to please Allah Azza wa Jalla. And bi idnillahi ta'ala, we'll pick up where we left off. We'll do a brief recap. Uh, in the very beginning of January, inshallah, when we start back up the, the classes. Uh, we'll do a brief recap of what has already proceeded, inshallah. And then we'll pick up with the darajat, which is a little shorter than the, the kafarat. And then we'll go into the da'wat, which is longer. And it's beautiful, subhanAllah. And we'll deal, inshallah, maybe, if Allah um, gives us uh, the ability and the tawfiq, Go into a little bit about uh, love as ibadah. Because uh, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot that, that usually goes unnoticed uh, in terms of loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how, and loving what Allah loves and some of those requirements. So inshallah ta'ala, we'll pick that up uh, in the beginning of January. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, wallahu ta'ala a'lam. And alhamdulillah, this was an hour exactly. Allah It's an hour exactly. Tayyip.